and welcome to today's edition. My name is Julia Lundstrom and I'm your hostess. Today I have Dr. Richard W. Sears. He is a board certified clinical psychologist in a private practice in Cincinnati, Ohio. He's also the director for clinical mindfulness and meditation and holds a number of faculty and clinical appointments, including the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. He's studied and taught mindfulness for over 35 years, holds a fifth degree black belt in ninju, ninjutsu, it's a hard one for me to say, served briefly as a bodyguard for the Dalai Lama and has received transmission as a Zen master. He's also the author of 11 different books, including Mindfulness, Living Through Challenges, and Enriching Your Life in This Moment. So Dr. Sears, thank you so much for being here. Um, such a pleasure having you. Yeah, wonderful to be here. Awesome. Um, so you're going to be talking to us today around mindfulness, which I'll be honest, I don't, I'm one of the people who doesn't quite understand the difference between mindfulness and meditation. So will you help me kind of differentiate there? Yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion with that. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it's important just to recognize the difference. So Meditation is a very broad term. It can really mean almost any way of working with the mind. There are literally thousands of different kinds of meditation, and they have different purposes. They have different effects on your consciousness. Um, there are different techniques and methods. Uh, so mindfulness is a specific type of meditation, and we'll talk about that today, but it's basically paying attention. So uh, it's not about changing your consciousness, visualizing different things that you want. Those are all wonderful approaches, but mindfulness is just a different approach in that it's about being more here, more present uh, in this moment. So it doesn't make mindfulness better than any other type of meditation, but it's important to set the intention what you're wanting to do. So what we'll talk about today is mindfulness being more uh, awake, more alert, more attentive in the actual moments as they occur. And so what would be some of the, the different benefits you would get from mindfulness versus meditation? Well, and again, it depends on the goal and the purpose. In the old days, basically everyone was taught mindfulness first because it's really hard to do the other kinds of meditation if you can't pay attention and keep your attention you know, where it needs to be. And I think nowadays mindfulness is a really important one because with technology, you know, it can be a wonderful thing like giving us the ability to communicate here, but it can also be a curse where we're just constantly cell phones dinging and, you know, I've got three electronic devices right here in front of me right now, which can be useful, but at other times our attention's scattered. We're not able to be present with people or family or work and we end up living for the future in our heads or we end up stuck in the past and we're missing out on this present moment which you know is the only time we have and you know we're talking about living long and living well it's not going to matter the length of your life if you're not able to actually be in the moments of your life as they're occurring if you're living in your head the whole time no matter how long your life is it's going to feel like it's flying by yeah, and you're not going to really be remembering the special moments anyway, right? You're kind of just right. if you're living in the future. You're not paying attention to what's happening today and creating those beautiful moments that you'll remember when you're 100 and that'll keep you going, you know? Yeah, yeah. Alan Watts talks about this trick, this trick that's played on every one of us in most of the cultures today, and that is the good stuff is coming in the future, so we set up from a young age this mentality of just keep working hard, set aside your pleasures. It's all coming in the future, right? Hey, just wait till you're old enough, then you'll get to go to school. And, you know, won't that be great? And uh, kindergarten, oh, you better do well in kindergarten because you want to get into first grade. Oh, and you better do well in first grade because you want to get into second grade and middle school and high school and then college. Oh, and then you get a job. And once you get a job, won't that be great? Because then money will come and then you'll be able to buy stuff and, and that won't satisfy you very long. So you gotta buy more stuff and oh, you better get that promotion because retirement's coming, right? And so we get this mentality of it's always coming. And what happens is you finally wake up one day and realize, you know, wait a minute, I, I've been tricked, right? This is my life right here and now and I've been in it all along, but I've 
been living for the future and unable to enjoy it, even when wonderful stuff happens, not to mention all the small stuff in daily life, we lose the capacity to enjoy it because our habit is to always jump to the next thing. So even when a great thing happens, we're thinking about the next thing after that. Um, so of course we need to plan for the future and we need to, you know, reflect on the past and learn from our past mistakes and enjoy past memories. But if we live there, we're going to miss out on this moment, which is the only time we're ever going to feel anything or do anything or experience anything. Do you have any theories on why we're like that? Like why it, it, it almost seems like it's built in, you know, I have a little baby who's constantly trying to do what his older brother is doing and wants to be bigger and better, you know, do you think that's what, something we're born with, or do you think that that's something our society raises us to be? Um, well, it's probably a mixture, but I would lean toward the societal piece. I mean, even you can see in the last couple of generations, right, uh, this tendency to want to keep achieving for the future. And it's not that people didn't do that in the past, but, you know, it was a pretty normal thing for most people to just sit on the porch and just look at the trees and watch the neighbors go by. Um, you know, the funny thing is all this technology was supposed to save us time, right? You know, uh, we don't have to write letters by hand anymore and stuff them in an envelope and walk to the post office. We can just type it in and it's sent, right? We don't have to go to the library anymore and go to that uh, card catalog and look up every little thing we want to know. We can just ask uh, Google or Siri or whatever right in our hand. And, and yet we're not using all that extra time to relax and enjoy the moments, we're filling it even more with uh, different things. So I definitely think there's a cultural, there's a social influence of, you know, what are you going to be when you grow up is a common question instead of, you know, who are you right now? Um, again, I, I think it's important to plan for the future, but when you don't realize it's just, you know, a, a tool or a temporary thing you get lost in this idea of the future yeah, i know i certainly have had that experience many times in my life where it's i just get so stressed and all i'm doing is is focusing on what's going to happen tomorrow or next day or next week or even next year you know these big giant goals and you you lose little precious moments you know and so i know personally i've spent the last seven or eight years really trying to be more present and so you're saying that is kind of your definition of mindfulness. Yeah, there, there's a little more to it than that, but part of it is uh, finding a balance between, you know, where you keep your own attention, you know. Once in a while, somebody says, well, what about somebody that's too in the moment? They just sit there and they're not fulfilling their duties and they're not working. And I've never met anyone who's too in the moment. In my experience, <laughs> Uh, you know, even around the Dalai Lama, he's always planning and reflecting and trying to help, right? Uh, in my experience, when somebody's too in the moment, it really means they're avoiding responsibility and they just don't want to plan and they don't want to be responsible for their actions and things like that. So uh, to me, it's about finding a balance there. Uh, but yeah, so there are different aspects of mindfulness. First part of it is that it's sort of an emerging awareness, this ability to come into the actual moment where you are, right? Because we have this tendency to get lost in automatic pilot mode where we go through the motions in our life and we're barely even aware of what we're doing. I mean, a lot of people I talk to say, you know, it feels, my it feels like my life is uh, I wake up, I feed the kids, I go to work, I come home, feed the kids, put them to bed, and 30 years have gone by and uh, it feels like it was just this automatic routine and I wasn't actually enjoying any of those moments. So this emerging awareness is that ability to drop into the moments as they are. Even people watching this interview might end up thinking about, oh, where am I going to go for lunch later? Or what do I got to do next? Or I can't believe that meeting I just left. And then suddenly, oh, wait, I'm, I'm watching this talk about mindfulness right now. <laughs> That's your awareness coming into what you're actually doing right here and now. And so that's what can help us enrich the moments. Because even if the moment's not pleasant, I'd rather be present in it to deal with it more effectively, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got an, if you go to the emergency room and you have this awful, you know, uh, accident, you don't want the physician to say, oh my gosh, that's horrible. I'm going to just close my eyes and uh, think about something else and relax, you know? There's a time and a place for that, but in that moment, you want the person to be able to say, okay, let me deal with this, pay full, close attention in this moment. 
So this is a, another distinction between mindfulness and some other types of meditation. It's moving into the experiences, even if we don't like them. So funny thing is when you practice mindfulness, you might not feel better in the short run because you may move into what's really happening right now and realize, wow, I didn't realize how stressed I'm feeling. I didn't notice the pain or the tension in my body. So in that sense, you feel worse. But I think that's an important first step because how are you going to deal with stress, move through it, uh, change your relationships to things if you're not aware of what's happening? So a big component of this is what's actually here, whether I like it or not, and then I can make a more conscious choice about what to do next. Oh, and the, one of the ways we do that is with our attentional capacity. And as I think I said at the beginning, paying attention all by itself really is a great definition of mindfulness. It's just um, using your attention in the way that you want to do it. So there's an on purpose piece of mindfulness too, not shifting your consciousness. It's basically asking yourself, is what I'm doing right now, is where my attention is right now, where I want it to be, then I fall back into some kind of automatic worrying about work or thinking about the past and, and not really mean to. I just kind of did it automatically. So you can look at that. Well, I'm thinking about work tomorrow. Do I want to keep doing this? And if not, put your attention back where you want it to be. And so in a very real way, we're exercising our attentional capacity because your mind will just keep wandering off so you bring it back and it wanders off and you bring it back brain studies have actually showed that even after an eight-week mindfulness course uh, certain parts of the brain actually get thicker uh, specifically the one of the areas is the medial prefrontal cortex so right here in the front middle part of your brain we can actually see that get a little bit thicker even after eight weeks of, of practice because you're using those brain circuits more so just like when you use your muscles more, they develop and strengthen, and, and we can actually see that now on a brain scanner. So that's pretty fascinating. And have you, I mean, as a clinical psychologist, have you, have you seen that in your practice? Do you, do you have some great stories for us that you can share? Yeah. Uh, you mean in terms of the brain or just uh, the different effects of... I mean, have you seen patients kind of transform when they start using the mindfulness? And yeah, you know, have you yeah, seen that happens? Yeah, yeah. Because in, in fact, I actually was part of the uh, children's uh, hospital research team here in Cincinnati, the first to do this with kids. And we could actually watch and see brain changes even after this program we use with these kids. And yeah, it, it's, it's like a skill that takes a little bit of time it, it's something that is kind of common sense. Most people can get the idea pretty quickly, but it's so easy to fall back into old habits that it can be nice to have uh, a mentor or a program or some kind of structure to keep uh, doing the practices. One of the biggest ways I see it transform people is that it teaches them to uh, let go of unnecessary struggle with themselves. And in fact, the research supports this too. People who practice mindfulness, both patients as well as clinicians, by the way, um, rate higher on scales of self-compassion. Because what can happen is we get this tendency to battle our own experiences, especially when they're unpleasant, and you know, understandably, but what that tends to do is keep us stuck, right? So for instance, our own thoughts. There's a component of mindfulness called decentering, which is where you learn to see your thoughts as thoughts instead of get caught up, getting caught up in arguing with your thoughts, right? There's some school of thought that says you should really counter your arguments with logical counters, you know, to get rid of some of those, uh, what we might call maladaptive or irrational thoughts, right? And it works well for some people, but for a lot of us, it's hard because we're arguing with ourselves. So we know what we're going to say and we tend to have great counters, right? So this thought comes up like, oh, I'm never going to get better at this. Uh, well, yes, you will if you work hard. Well, I've been working hard for years and I'm still not better. Well, but uh, you saw some improvement. Well, that's just because somebody helped me, right? And what happens is you get into this argument with yourself. And it's a funny thing that we do. I mean, we all do it, but such a funny thing because who are you going to win against if you're <laughs> with yourself? It's, it's just your own thoughts. <laughs> so what you can learn to do over time is recognize the pattern. So this is that emerging awareness we're talking about with mindfulness. Wow, 
wow, look at that. I'm having an argument with myself as to whether or not I'm ever going to achieve anything. Instead of arguing with it more, I realize because I'm arguing, I must be stressed out. The stress is the real problem because I don't argue with myself when I'm in a calm place. So instead of going on with the argument, I step back from it and just see it as a sign of my stress. And then I deal with the stress directly. I take a walk or take a breath or talk to a friend or whatever helps me instead of going on with uh, the argument that I can't really win against since it's me on both sides, right? And it's an amazing process to watch people go through that transformation. It kind of is like, you know, you're having this tug of war. And wow, you get really caught up. This side's going to win and no, I'm losing. And you really get caught up. And then there's a moment when you realize, wait, these are both my hands. So the answer is not to work harder and pull harder. It's to step back from the struggle. And in the case of thoughts, you learn to be kind to yourself. Oh, I'm having those thoughts. I must be stressed out. Because what a lot of people do is they get upset at their upset thoughts, right? So I'm thinking I'm a terrible person. What's wrong with me for thinking I'm a terrible person? I'm such an awful person for thinking I'm a terrible person. And so this negative thought comes up and they assault it with more negative thoughts. So it's a downward spiral, right? Yeah, absolutely. So this uh, capacity is to step back and, you know, there I go again with those thoughts. You don't have to keep engaging or fighting with them. You know, oh, how curious that these thoughts are back. That must be a sign that I'm feeling stressed out right now. And similarly with our feelings, right? We tend to think um, unpleasant feelings are something evil we've got to battle and get rid of as if it's some kind of alien invader, but it's, it's my own body giving me some kind of message. Now, I may not like the message, but I don't need to attack the messenger, right? right. Uh, but we have this tendency, I get stressed out about my stress, or I get anxious about my anxiety, or I get depressed about my depression, or I hurt for my pain, or I'm ashamed of my shame, or I'm guilty about my guilt, you know, on and on and on. And it's kind of like recognizing, oh, sadness is here. You don't have to get upset at yourself for feeling that. That's just what your body's doing. And it's not like your life gets easy at that point, but I've watched so many people go through this transformation where they spend less energy battling themselves and more energy doing the things that matter to them, that give them a sense of purpose and value in their life instead of spending their time struggling to, to fix their own thoughts or emotions as if they were broken intrinsically. Right. And so does that bring down the level of the stress chemical cortisol as well? Have you seen that? Yeah. Yeah. So the stress response, right, kicks in this cortisol and it's, it's a good thing in the short run, the stress response, right, as we all know. I mean, in fact, I once heard that if you just started running uh, and you did not have a stress response, you'd fall over dead in about 30 seconds. Your, your body needs that oxygen. So the cortisol gets your heart pumping faster. It increases the blood pressure to push that oxygenated blood into the extremities and you know cuts down the digestion and increases the immune system. So in that 90 seconds or so that it was designed to be activated, it's a really good thing. The problem is, though, um, our brain gets activated even by thoughts about stressful situations, right? So when you're running from a tiger, that 90 seconds is a useful thing. But what happens is we get tigers of the mind. I think about, oh, this report I've got to do tomorrow and oh, how badly that meeting went yesterday. And so what happens is I'm washing my brain in cortisol and adrenaline, you know, these glucocorticoids. And so what's happening is this short-term response is now happening all day long. So what was good in the short run now becomes heart problems, digestion problems, tense muscles, uh, immune problems, et cetera. So when we can recognize that we're doing this with our thoughts, we can just kind of step back from it and get less caught up in it. Uh, in fact, another analogy is that of watching a movie, right? If you've ever watched a really good movie, it's like you're in it, right? And you can feel scared and you can feel sad and you can laugh. But when you've seen that same movie a hundred times and you can step back and look at it as a movie, you can just see it for what it is. It's just nothing but flickering images on the screen, right? And this is a funny thing to say, but your thoughts are no more than internalized 
words. They're, they don't have a physical reality to them. They're just representations. So you can start to see, oh, there goes my mind doing this and that again, or there goes my old habit of worrying about what's going to happen next. And you don't have to engage with it or get caught up in it. Just like talking to a movie screen is not going to change anything. You just see it for what it is. Um, you know, sometimes the thoughts are useful, but when you see that it's just a pattern that's not getting you anywhere, you can just kind of step back from it and then decide what you want to do in this moment. Are there any longevity studies around mindfulness? Since this is live long well, has it been shown to help us live longer, better? I mean, obviously better, but live longer. Right, right. So, yeah, as we talked about, the living better, I think, is important because of the richness that this can bring by being more present, actually tasting your food and playing with your children and seeing your partner and looking in their eyes and appreciating that, that certainly enriches it. But there is also literally some uh, studies about uh, uh, improving uh, the telomere um, uh, aspect of the DNA. Now, let me briefly mention what this is. If you haven't heard of this before, a telomere is basically an end cap on DNA. So every cell in our body has DNA and the DNA splits and replicates itself and splits and replicates itself. So the telomere is kind of like a shoelace on the end of a shoestring. Now, it just shortens over time. It's just what it naturally does. But things like stress and smoking and things like that actually cause them to shrink even faster. And just like with a shoestring, if that cap comes off, it just frays and it, it doesn't work so well. If that telomere shrinks too fast, it interferes with the replication of the DNA. So basically your cells don't divide anymore or they don't divide the way they need to. And that's, that's the aging process. So there's actually been studies where people practice mindfulness and it shortens, or I should say it prevents the shortening of the telomeres, and it may even look like it lengthens it a little bit. So it's almost like you're giving yourself back some of that time you lost. So with the telomere, you can see what your biological age is, even though your chronological age might, may, not, may not match it. So Are you able to measure that somehow? Yeah, I mean, that's not my area of expertise, but they can literally um, uh, you know, look at the DNA and see the links. And so what they do is these randomized studies and they measure the length of these things and they uh, see that people that practice mindfulness and it, it applies to other stress reducing things as well, because stress is one of the big factors. And they can see that it at least slows down the shrinking and there's more of a I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it, telom telomerase or something like that, the enzyme that actually helps repair that and keep it from shrinking. There's more of that in the body. So pretty fascinating to see. It's fascinating, uh, yeah. Like that from something that seems, you know, very subtle and hard to measure. Wow, that's certainly going to have to look more into that. So we know, okay, with the telomeres, we know that it actually can help us live longer. It actually sounds like a little bit of an anti-aging trick, which is awesome. So how does one go about practicing mindfulness? Well, um, I'm happy to do a short exercise with people right now. I love that. Yeah, let's go. Let's do yeah. it. And then we can talk about how to continue with that. Um, now, let me also mention there's copies of this uh, you can find on the Internet. Or if you go to my website, there's a free copy of it, too. So people can just experience it and not try to remember it as they're doing it, but just experience it. It's called the three minute breathing space. And I like that because it's short enough. Most people can say, well, three minutes, I can do that. You know, people often have trouble committing to too much time in their busy days. But three minutes, most people can put that in. And as you'll, you're about to see, it also has a lot of different components to it that can be helpful. So maybe instead of talking about it, we'll just do it right now. So for most people, I, I tell them there's really not a magic way to sit, but typically it's, it's better for your uh, breath if you sit up mostly straight. It doesn't have to be stiff or anything like that, but just sort of naturally upright. It also signals to your mind that you're going to pay attention by sitting in a, a little more upright position. As far as the eyes go, um, it's okay to kind of look down at the floor, kind of shade your eyes a little bit. If you're really tired, closing your eyes can make people fall right to sleep. <laughs> By the way, it's funny to me, I tell people this is good to practice at work, 
but if it looks weird sitting still and not doing anything at work, just, just hold your phone in front of you because no one would question you looking at your phone for three minutes. So you can just pretend you're looking at email and doing something productive. So <laughs> anyway, when you find that comfortable position, I'll just walk people through this exercise if they want to do with it with me right now. First thing you might want to remind yourself is simply that in this moment, there literally is nowhere else you could be. You don't have to be doing something more important. Our brains often have this idea that we've always got to fill our time with something productive. Just give yourself permission, first of all, to just be here for yourself for right now. And the first part of this exercise is just to check in with yourself because we're always thinking about other people and other times and other places. So just check in with yourself right now, starting with your physical body. Just from your head down to your toes, just do a quick scan and notice any sensations in your physical body. Might have even forgotten you had a body till just now. So just kind of check in with it. Notice the feeling of your clothing or the pressure of the chair you're sitting in. And even notice if there's any muscle tension or any discomfort. For right now, we're not necessarily trying to make ourselves relax or change anything. It's just kind of checking in for right now. And then check in with your emotional state. How are you feeling right now? Are you a little bit tired or irritated or happy or some combination of things? And see how you know that. Are there places in your physical body that give you some clues about your emotional state? And again, for right now, you don't have to try to fix your feelings or analyze them or make them go away. Just give yourself permission to feel whatever you're already feeling. And then check in with what you're thinking. What thoughts or images are coming and going in your mind from moment to moment? And see if you can notice your thoughts without getting lost or carried away by your thoughts. Kind of like that movie analogy I used earlier. See if you can notice the thoughts, but kind of step back and just watch them come and go. And then the second part of this exercise is to let all that go as best you can and just Feel the breath for one minute. So this is just a way of collecting our attention, gathering ourselves, centering ourselves. We're just going to put the attention on one thing, in this case, the breath. And as best you can, instead of thinking about the breath or picturing the breath. Can you get in touch with the actual sensations? Notice the stomach rising and falling. Or maybe you notice the air as it moves in and out of your nose. It's a little bit cooler when you inhale and a little bit warmer when you exhale. Chances are your mind's going to wander off or some sound will distract you. That's okay. That's what the mind is designed to do. So instead of struggling with your mind, just notice as best you can when it goes off and just keep gently bringing it back to the breath. And then the third part of this exercise is to expand out from just the breath to include the entire body all at once with your attention, sort of a broad attention. So instead of 
feeling like you're just a brain with something kind of dangling underneath? Can you feel your entire body all at once, your embodied presence? And if you find it helpful, you can even remind yourself, whatever's going on, whatever is here, it's already here anyway. So I can let things be just exactly as they are for just this moment. Just a few more moments being present in your body before we end this exercise. And now we'll just return our attention back to the room around us and allow your eyes to come open if they were closed. And notice this transition back to the rest of the room. This can be a good way to bring some of this awareness back into the next few moments of your day. That was amazing. Oh, okay. I will say, so I was doing it along with you and, you know, sometimes I get a little, little nervous doing these interviews and I want them to flow well and I, you know, I have little, little butterflies. And so now I just feel so much more relaxed. You can probably even see it in my mannerisms. Okay, I think this will be a great one to come back to and just do, because I know yeah. in my experience, the more stressed out I get or the more out of practice I get in mindfulness or meditation or whatever practice it is, mm -hmm. um, I, I have a tendency, it's really hard to get back into it. And so I find that having a recording like this uh, having something to go to and you said you have other ones on your website and of course we'll have links for that but um really helps me to have kind of a guided mindfulness practice when yeah. i'm out of practice you know eventually i can do it on my own but i know i've gone in and out of meditation cycles and mindfulness cycles and it's always so nice when my mind is running a million miles per hour, just to sit back and have somebody walk me through this. So thank you so much. That was awesome. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, the structure can definitely be helpful. Otherwise, we just keep falling back into old patterns and the mind keeps wandering off. So it can be nice to have a voice or a consistent practice to kind of keep you back and recentering yourself. And, you know, it's wonderful that you ended up relaxing. The funny thing is some people don't. Um, and I think this is a really important point. Mindfulness isn't meant to relax you. That's a funny thing to say. And in my experience, most of the time you end up relaxed, but in a way we could say that's a side effect. And what I mean by that is maybe you've experienced this yourself because you know we all do when you think, okay, I have to relax now. You know, you're setting yourself up for a paradoxical uh, situation, right? I'm trying to relax. The only way you can relax is to let your body relax, not to try. <laughs> and in fact, just yesterday, I was working with someone with insomnia where you get caught up in the cycle where I need to go to sleep. So I try to go to sleep and then I'm not. So I get upset that I'm not sleeping, which makes it harder to sleep, which makes more and more upset, which makes it harder to sleep. So Mindfulness is just noticing what's happening. Now, in most cases, what people find is by noticing what happening is happening, they notice, that, okay, there's some stress here, there's some muscle tension here, there's some thoughts here, and it's kind of like you were doing this and didn't know it, so you relax in the sense of you just kind of stop engaging with the things that are keeping you uh, stressed out. So most people kind of relax as a nice side effect. Okay. Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with that because most people feel, uh, it reminds me of the movie Eat, Love, Pray with Julia Roberts, you know, when she's in India and, or the, or the book, just better, of course, um, she's in India and she's at this ashram and she's struggling to meditate because she can't focus her thoughts and she's frustrated that everyone else can do it and she's frustrated that she can't do it and she looks at the clock after a minute. And I think that's the picture most people have in their head. Like they're supposed to shut off the voice and they're supposed to right. stop thinking. And I, 
can you talk to that? Because that is such a misnomer, right? Yeah, that's really important. And in fact, you cannot stop your thoughts. And this is a really funny thing for a psychologist to say, but you can't control your emotions either. <laughs> now, most people, when they hear that, they're like, well, wait, that's why I'm here. You need to fix these thoughts and fix these emotions. But our thinking is what our brain's designed to do. Our emotions are very important pieces of information. We don't want to be able to shut them off. Um, now, what happens is we get caught up in them and they become stronger because we're engaging and fighting. But for instance, an emotion is supposed to just deliver a message. It's really not supposed to last more than about a minute and a half. Your emotion just kind of flows through. It's giving you a message. But when you don't listen to the message, it just keeps hammering at you. Um, you know, I remember when my kids were younger, maybe you've experienced this too and some of our uh, viewers here, you know, you're home with the kids and they're playing, but, but there's just one thing you need to do real quick. Maybe it's send an email or something. So while they're busy, you go over there and try to get this email done. And all of a sudden you hear, you know, hey, dad, hey, dad, hey, dad, hey, dad. You know, and you look back and hold on, I just got to finish this just a minute. And, you, you know, the more you push them back, the more they just, hey, dad, hey, dad. And, you know, and you, you look back, they're not bleeding or anything like that, right? But you're like, hold on, hold on. And then you finally get the set and you turn around. What is it? And they just say, I love you. And then they went off and play. Right? <laughs> right? It's like they wanted to give you this message, but you weren't listening to it. And so it gets louder until you finally hear it. And in a funny way, if you don't want to hear your emotions, they tend to keep going on and on. So you have to be very careful. Some of these relaxation techniques or these techniques where you think you're trying to stop your thoughts or stop the bad feelings end up being avoidance, which in the long run, makes it worse because they just keep coming back around or you think hey i haven't thought about that thought today oh now it's back again right this weird paradox so you just learn to see it for what it is and mindfulness isn't escaping uh, and by the way that's i'm not saying that's good or bad relaxation techniques are good because they're they're like taking a vacation we all need a vacation we all need to just relax but if every time something difficult comes up, and as they will do in modern life, you have to try to get away from it. You're setting up this cycle of avoidance that keeps you kind of trapped. So mindfulness is moving right into it, even if it's pain, even if it's uh, stress or anxiety, even if it's unpleasant thoughts, and just allowing it to pass through naturally. Um, most people, you know, when they come to me, they 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 feel like it makes no sense that I would have them move into something unpleasant that they want to get rid of. So a metaphor that often seems uh, useful is to think of moving into a cold swimming pool, right? If you've ever had that experience of dipping your foot in a cold swimming pool, you think, oh, I'm, I'm just going to not even bother going in there, right? But your family's begging you to jump on in there, right? You know, if you go in, you're going to feel worse at first. And the scientific term for this is extinction burst, right? If you feel stress and move into it, it gets a little worse. And most people, because it's getting worse, they say, well, this is a bad idea. I'm going to go back to avoidance, right? But you know, if you stay in the swimming pool, that passes. And in fact, it's about a minute and a half or so for most people. That body just kind of adjusts and then you're fine, right? And there's two options. You can just dive on in and we'll have it pass all at once, or you can walk over the steps, right? And just put one foot in at a time, do it slowly. But the point is you move into it and it may get worse, but you just stay with it and it moves through your body adjust. And it's the same with our emotions. If you jump into an emotion or the swimming pool and think, oh, this is awful. And you jump back out and jump in and jump out and jump. That's what really uh, causes this problem. So it's a different approach to move into and work through our experiences than try to, uh, and especially the internal experiences. So we're not battling ourselves all the time. So it's important to feel the emotions, but kind of observe them versus getting lost in them and getting in that, that downward spiral, like you said before, right? Right. And I'm not saying enjoy it or wallow in them or whatever, but it's just your own body giving you a message. It's not something you have to get rid of. In fact, some people, some people, parents can appreciate an analogy I use of, it's like holding a crying baby that's upset, right? If the baby's upset, you know, it's like anxiety or stress. 
you don't shout at it and shut up, shut up. You know, that's not going to help anything. And obviously it could damage the baby. Assuming there's not a pinched diaper or something, the thing to do with a crying baby is just cradle, you know, until the emotion flows through. And it's kind of funny for grown adults maybe to do this. You don't have to physically do it, but you could even literally just, yeah, I'm stressed right now. Right? Most people get upset with themselves for being stressed instead of being kind to themselves for being stressed. And you know, talking about living long well, your life is going to be a lot more pleasant when you're kind with yourself because that tends to translate into your interactions with others. If you're beating yourself up all the time, you're not even going to be probably noticing your relationships or what you're doing in life. In fact, a lot of people get caught up in trying to fix and control their emotions and stop living their lives. You know, one thing you were uh, asking about earlier on is another piece of my therapy about commitment or purpose or moving toward what we value. And this is another really well-researched cutting edge. I mean, it's been around for decades, but great research on something called acceptance and commitment therapy. And what this is about, the acceptance is related to the mindfulness stuff we've been talking about. It basically says, what is the reality right now in this moment? Even if I don't like it, even if it's painful, what's actually happening right now? And then the commitment piece is, what do I want to be doing right now that will make my life more fulfilling? What would give me a sense of purpose? There's actually been research that shows if you make your life about trying to fix all your problems and get rid of your suffering first and then live something uh, more fulfilling or do something that matters to you, you might just never get around to doing those things because there's just no end to problems if you're alive and have families and work, etc. Interestingly, the same research showed that even with all the suffering, stress, whatever you're dealing with, you just decide, I'm going to make a commitment to myself to do what matters to me. I'm going to spend time with my family or I'm going to do more things out in nature because that really is fulfilling to me. Your suffering is more likely to actually go down as a sort of a side effect because you're living a life that matters. And, you know, what's the point of living long if your life doesn't matter, of course? So that's a huge piece. You know, what, what draws you? And, you know, even from a practical point of view, let's say you do have chronic pain. Would you rather do things that matter and bring the pain with you or just you know, struggle with pain. Um, I'm not saying it's easy. Something like chronic pain is very challenging, but if you can't do something about the pain, at least are there ways you can bring some things into your life that matter to you that are more fulfilling and, and give you that direction in life? Yeah, I would say that the, the chronic pain is one of the hardest ones. I know that my brother was in chronic pain for last few years he had um, a herniated disc in his back and kept avoiding surgery and and i will say it was one of the unhappiest times for him because he just didn't know how to be happy in the moment when he was yeah. just struggling with the pain so what do you tell somebody like that and, and fortunately he got surgery on the disc and literally within i think it was three hours he's like wow i can't feel any pain so oh, uh, Luckily, he, he was one of the success stories with surgery around that and now is, is pain-free. But what, how do you talk to somebody in that kind of a situation when they're, when they're just, he, I mean, he was really struggling to even walk at certain points, so. Yeah, yeah. This, this is a really important question because some people um, give the impression that, oh, if I just meditate, you know, I'll love the pain and it'll be groovy and, you know. Obviously, if you have chronic pain, your BS detector is going to go off and you're going to run out of the room, right? Obviously, pain hurts by definition. And it's very, very challenging living with chronic pain because uh, for a lot of people, there's no signs of the pain on the outside, right? So people don't understand how hard it can be for you to even get out of bed or to do anything because the pain is just here in your attention and in your face all the time. So I don't want to imply at all that this is easy. But what starts to happen is here's pain, by definition, it hurts, right? Obviously, if there are any medical things you can do, I think it's important to look at those pieces. But from a psychological point of view, here's the pain, and then I fight the pain because I don't like it. I try to push it away or my, my muscles tense up around the hurt area because I think I'm trying to protect it. 
Um, I get angry at the pain and I curse the pain at all the things it's robbed me of. And so I'm firing the stress response in my body. And one of the things the stress response does is cause inflammation. And so this inflammation can make the pain even worse than it is. Because I'm in pain, I tell myself I'm not going to do anything. So now I'm not moving or exercising. And so the joints can become even more atrophied. I stop doing the things that matter to me because I don't think I can do them anymore. So now my life feels like it has no purpose. So, you know, you were talking about that downward spiral uh, that can start to happen. So it's not like the pain gets easier, but what you can learn to do is relate to it differently. So if the pain is right here, maybe we can just kind of move it over here. Bring, it's kind of funny to say it this way, but it's like you bring the pain with you and just go to the family event anyway. I mean, obviously don't do anything that would damage your body, but are there ways you can bring more of that purpose into your life, even with the limitations that you have? Are there ways you can let go of the resistance to the pain, let go of some of the struggle with the pain, disengage from some of those constant thoughts assaulting you about the pain and again this sounds backwards but when i have individuals with chronic pain i ask them to move right into the middle of it just like i was talking about with that swimming pool right so it sounds pretty backwards but when you distinguish your thoughts about the pain from your emotional reactions to the pain to the actual sensations because the pain itself is physical sensations again this isn't easy but the sensations wax and wane, they come and go, it's vocalized, spread out. And so like a scientist, you can move into it and explore it. And in a way you start to kind of cradle that pain, kind of like that crying baby. It's not, you know, it doesn't mean it stops hurting, but it's amazing the amount of struggle you can let go of and use that energy for, for other things. It's a process that takes some time, but I've seen some amazing uh, results. And the research shows at a very minimum, if you practice mindfulness with chronic pain, uh, people tend to take less pain medication. So for some people, just that alone is a pretty good uh, outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly younger people, uh, don't often feel experience chronic pain, but the older we get, the more likely there is that pain is just going to be a part of aging. Now, certainly if you take good care of your health, you're less likely to, but just by accidents or injuries, you know, we can just learn to kind of bring the pain with us. Um, it's just going to be an inevitable part of getting older. So uh, when we develop this relationship that we can let go of some of the struggle, uh, not necessarily stop the pain from uh, interrupting what's really important to us, just learning to relate to it a little bit differently. Kind of speaking of the youth side of things, and it's funny because I can hear my, my kids, um, how do you bring this to kids? Because you were talking about that earlier that you work with kids, and I, I think yeah. that's really a, a fascinating subject on trying to get kids to practice mindfulness and for a lot of people, I know we, we have a lot of people with grandkids as well that are listening. I know my mom tries to get uh, her grandkids to, to do it a lot, and I don't, they, they don't understand or understand why. So how do you work with kids in this manner? How do you get them to practice? Oh, no, you know, interesting question, because, you know, in my experience and observations, we're all born with this. Um, you know, once in a while, somebody comes up to me and says, you know, how do I teach my three-year-old mindfulness? And most of the time, what I'll say is, I'll bet your three-year-old could teach you a thing or two about mindfulness. I mean, just watch kids at play. They are fully in the moment and they can really just be there. And in fact, I think my youngest daughter was three. One day, I, I remember I picked her up from school and I had told her, you know, one day this week when I pick you up from school, we'll go to the local ice cream place. In fact, she called it ice cream eyeballs because it was soft serve and they put little sugar eyeballs on the ice cream cone. So anyway, I pick her up from school. She jumps in the car, this little three-year-old, daddy, are we going to have ice cream today? And I said, oh, I'm sorry, honey. I told your mom that we'd go meet her over here right now, but we'll get ice cream tomorrow. And you should have seen the look on her little face. She was like, tomorrow I waited my whole life for ice cream right because <laughs> when you're that young you are so in the moment 24 hours is a lot of 
now moments, right? But as I said, the older we get, the more we tend to live for the future and get outside. I mean, for most adults, when tomorrow is literally nothing, but that's a lot of now. So maybe the question should be, how do we not, how do we teach them not to get out of mindfulness, right? How do we yeah, get out of their way? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think that's really important. Can we uh, model for them uh, being present, right? <laughs> maybe embarrassing for a mindfulness teacher to say that, but I remember years ago, maybe my daughter was two or something like that. I was checking my email on my phone here and she literally grabbed my phone, pointed to her face and said, daddy, I'm right here. <laughs> right? I thought, oh yes, you are, honey. Let's go play. And you know, for us to model that, to not be using our devices at dinner time and not to be half at work when we're playing with our kids or whatever, but you know, literally make time to model for them to continue uh, to do that. Now, to your question earlier of how we teach this to kids, what does happen is the older they get, the more they're starting to get into their minds more and more, and the more it can be useful, especially anxiety. Fascinatingly, in my experience, the kids who are most intelligent are more likely to get anxiety. In other words, they can think of more possibilities the smarter they are, but they're not yet old enough to realize it's really not likely to happen, right? So they learn, oh my gosh, a rock fell from the sky and killed 90% of all species, including the dinosaurs, you know, from the face of the earth. Is that going to happen today? Well, uh, there's a chance, but, you know, <laughs> there's a, you know, they see that. And so they start to worry, what if this happens? What if... In fact, uh, somebody wants to find anxiety as what if, followed by all the possible worst things that could happen, right? Nobody ever thinks, what if everything goes my way today? You know, it's always our mind is trying to help us by giving us. So the older we get, the more kids can see that. So the mindfulness training for kids tends to be a lot shorter, tends to engage more of the senses. It can often be more activities like balancing, right? You've got to be paying attention to balance on a balance beam, you know, some mindful stretching. Uh, so sort of like yoga, but kind of, uh, you know, modified for kids. Uh, we would also, and this is based on a protocol by Randy Simple and Jennifer Lee called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for children, uh, engaging more of the senses. So we might blindfold them and then have them smell different cups and try to identify what it is. They've got a pay attention to their senses. They might feel different things and try to identify that. They might listen to music. So they got to keep their attention on the music, see what feelings it brings up or what thoughts it brings up. Also distinguishing between description and judgment. Now you brought up judgment, how often it is, you know, Julia Roberts judging herself even during meditation, right? Judgments are not bad. We all need to make judgments as, you know, if this is going to be worth my time and money or if this is going to harm somebody. What happens though is these judgments happen constantly so that no matter what you're doing, the judgments are getting between you and the actual experience, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're kissing your partner, but in your mind you're thinking, well, this kiss is all right, but the one she gave me yesterday was spectacular. Why won't she kiss me like that right now? You're not actually feeling the kiss because you're judging it in your mind, which is taking you out of the moment, right? And don't we all have at least one friend or family member maybe that no matter how great something is, no matter what the occasion, they find something about it to judge, which means they're really never in the moment and happy with what's happening. So we can, we don't get rid of them. Those can be important, but we just learn to say, oh, look at that, the judgment's here again, and you just kind of let it float off and you decide whether or not you need to act on it. So in the kid's version, instead of getting all, uh, theoretical with that, we might, uh, you know, present something to them and then say, how would you describe this? Uh, somebody might say it's sticky. And then we might say, okay, sticky, is that a description or a judgment? Well, that's it's probably a description. It's, it's sticky, right? Somebody else might say, oh, it's gross. Okay, gross. Is that a description or a judgment? Well, it's probably more of a judgment. And it, it's not even good or bad that it's description or judgment, but can you tell the difference? Are you actually seeing what's there? Are you adding on judgment that's another layer? And again, that could be useful, might not be, but it starts with noticing that. In fact, a big piece 
about all this mindfulness training, we could really sum it up in a nutshell with noticing what's happening and then making a conscious choice about what you want to do instead of an old automatic reaction. I'll never forget this one young boy in, one, in our initial research. Uh, I think he was like nine years old and he came in one day and he basically said, you know, I was at school today and uh, the teacher made me mad. And uh, so I yelled at her and she yelled back. So I threw the eraser and then she sent me to the office and the principal yelled at me and then the vice principal yelled at me and sent me home and then my parents yelled at me, right? So all this externalizing stuff. Toward the end of this mindfulness program, this young boy came in one day and said something like, I was at school today and I really didn't like what the teacher was saying. I, she didn't know what she was talking about and it made me mad. And he said, I noticed I was getting mad. I felt my jaw get kind of tight and I felt my heart pounding and I started breathing faster. And I said to myself, I'm mad right now. I better not say anything to the teacher. I'm going to tell my parents about this when I get home. <laughs> you know? And I remember thinking, I don't care if you even know what the word mindfulness means, or I don't care if you get anything else out of this group. That's a success. In the moment, you notice what was happening, and then you made a choice. Now, he could have still chosen to throw the eraser if he thought it would have made a statement of you know, civil disobedience and you know, <laughs> bringing attention to an important issue or something. But chances are he was doing it as a reaction that would have made the situation worse, right? Kind of like a mini version of the 24-hour rule with email. Most people are probably familiar with that, right? They say that if you get an email that really irks you, good idea to wait 24 hours before you respond, right? Uh, yeah, have you ever not done that where you get this email and you're like, how dare they speak to me in this manner? And you fire off this, you know, harsh email back. And then you look at it the next day and you realize, Oh, this doesn't really sound that bad today. And then, you know, you look at your response and you look worse than the person that started it by the way you reacted, right? So And you always know that you've reacted poorly when you when you get their response and you don't want to read it, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, it's coming back. I don't want to see. It. <laughs> so even if it's a half a second, you can say, Wow, I'm getting really upset right now. Now that may not be a bad thing. You know, for instance, anger is energy and it could well be that something's happening that's not right. And anger says, I've got to do something about it. But if I pause even briefly first, what I do about it's probably going to be more productive than if I'm just reacting. Not to mention, this is a really big thing in relationships, right? All our old reactions start to uh, layer themselves on top of what's really happening. In fact, I don't know if this is really true or if it's based on research, but I once heard about 90% of an argument has nothing to do with the actual argument that's happening right now. Most of it's old stuff or old reactions or future concerns about what might happen if this goes the wrong way. So when you just come back to what's happening in this moment, you're probably going to end up dealing with it you know, a little better. I think that's great advice for all relationships because I know we, we all do it, right? We all yeah. carry all yeah. the baggage with us and bring it into the moment because really, are we really that upset that someone yeah. wishes away or, you know? Yeah, yeah. And on this topic, you know, I, I do couples counseling at times. and I went to a great workshop once that talked about after the fight, right? And this presenter made a great point it's easy to say, let's fight fair, let's not hit below the belt. And of course, if you can do that, but for most people, when they're upset, it just stuff comes out. So what's even more important is how do you repair a relationship? And here I think too, mindfulness can be important. And for living long well, we wanna repair our relationships that'll deepen them over a long period of time, right? And what I mean by that is after the argument's over, uh, what do you do? Do you pretend it never happened? Um, do you analyze it to death until, you know, you're beating a dead horse? Or are you able just to sit down and say, wow, you know, I really said some things I didn't mean and I'm very sorry, but I was hurt about this and can we talk about that piece, right? So can you go back and repair? You know, some people are terrified of that confrontation. They're afraid it's going to erupt again, and so they ignore it, and it festers over time, and it eats away at the relationship. 
many people who don't have experience with really getting close in relationships are surprised that when they do that, when they go back into this difficult thing and really discuss it, even though it's uncomfortable, it ends up deepening the relationship. You know, intimacy, the other side of intimacy is vulnerability. So I think mindfulness can be helpful for us to be able to be vulnerable, to let our feelings out a little bit, risk being hurt for the value of the relationship. You know, I once heard this in the undergraduate class of all places that real intimacy la that takes about 20 years to develop. And at the time I thought, well, that's ridiculous. You know, I can fall in love in a week. <laughs> you know, well, I, I, the chemical thing is a little different than real intimacy where you really uh, get close and make yourself vulnerable and expose all kinds of vulnerable pieces in the service of deepening and enriching. If you, and you know, the fact that relationships take effort. So there's another piece where mindfulness and attention can come into play where, you know, instead of seeing your partner as just a piece of furniture and you barely notice them, you can pay more attention and, you know, kind of see how their day was and greet them and make eye contact. And, you know, I don't know if you're a five-year-old still at this point, but I remember when my daughters were younger, you know, I could leave the room for just 15 minutes and when I come back, daddy, I missed you. You know, they are just so in the moment and appreciative of the people around them. I mean, obviously your friends might think that's a little weird. If, ah, wonderful to see you. But at the same time, you know how nice that is when a friend really greets you and is fully present and noticing that. Well, so a huge piece of living long well and, and so many longevity studies talk about you live longer when you have a relationship, when you, yes. when you stay married or you have a partner for life. Mm -hmm. um, you live much longer and you live much longer better. So the relationship piece is key. How do you practice mindfulness with your partner and your family? The thing I'll start off with that is don't force this down your family's throat. <laughs> if your attitude is coming in of this is good for you, you need to be more present, it, it always tends to backfire. And in fact, I found that true with kids too. You know, you better sit with me and meditate with me. It's good for you. Always creates resistance. The best way you can do it is to model it for yourself. Uh, to be more of what you want them to do. And they'll pick up on that. They might be interested, they might not be. But <laughs> something that's really funny to me is very often people that train in mindfulness with me will say, you know, since I've been practicing mindfulness, my partner's become a much nicer person. That's really weird, <laughs> right? <laughs> what happens is we become less reactive so our partners are not reacting to our reactiveness. So things diffuse more quickly. We spend more time together. We get closer. We want to spend more time together because we're closer. And very interesting, instead of a downward spiral, it's an upward spiral that can happen by just being more present. You know, even simple things like having a date night, you know, and with your kids as well as with your partner to really make time just to be present with them. I mean, it's really sad to me how often uh, you, you ever go to a restaurant and everybody at the table is texting. Maybe they're texting each other. I don't know, but nobody's making eye contact and nobody's really present, you know? So that's something we can model for our kids and for our families and bring it more in that way. Now there are uh, offerings. Sometimes people have couples mindfulness retreats where you kind of go through it with your partner and maybe you'll, look into each other's eyes or hold hands or, you know, do things together. It is really best if you can do it together because then that's motivating. And um, I do remember when we were looking into researching, teaching uh, mindfulness to kids, really wishing if we, it would be best to do it with the caregivers, with the parents and the kids together. So they're all on the same page. Uh, and in fact, if I could only pick one, I would train the parents or the caregivers in mindfulness and there'd be sort of a trickle down effect that the kids would pick it up. Otherwise the kids might be trying it, but it's sort of countered by the home environment and uh, depending on the parenting styles. Yeah. It's like everything lead by example. But for me, I know when I meditate, I usually go in a room and close the door. So I think um, I'm just sitting here thinking that, you know, that's probably the wrong move. Let them see me meditate. Let them, you know, even if they're crawling all over me, that's my practice of right, 
yeah, yeah. In the moment. So um, that I, I think that's great. I'm, I'm not going to hide myself now when I meditate. <laughs> You know, I, I can see two sides of that. One, I can see what you're saying, modeling that. But I think it's also good to have your personal time, right? This really comes up a lot when I teach people mindfulness because they feel like I'm so busy. You know, my kids need me. My partner needs me. My job needs me. You know, a lot of us are taught when all the work's done, then you can do something for yourself, and as you well know, that never happens. There's always something we've done. So you kind of have to make time. And sometimes people go through some emotional things about, oh, maybe I'm being selfish doing this, or I really shouldn't prioritize myself. But I often use the analogy of, you know, when you get on an airplane, they say, in the unlikely event of loss of cabin pressure, mass will drop from the ceiling. And have you ever noticed, they always say, put your own mask on first before helping others. Because we can get this automatic, oh, well, let me help you with your mask, and then I pass out, and then nobody's helped. <laughs> so it's a good analogy. If we don't take care of ourselves, how am I possibly going to help the other people in my lives? I have to have a good relationship. But sometimes I even tease people, and I say, you know, no one ever tells me I never brush my teeth, because that's two minutes a day. I could be accomplishing something more important, you know. If brushing your teeth is important to you, you just decide, I'm going to do that every day. So, you know, for people uh, to decide I'm going to practice mindfulness or meditation or take a walk, whatever it is for you, uh, you know, that's important. Yeah. And my here too, this doesn't have to be something different. I mean, I enjoy the structured piece and a lot of times people like the structure, but if you mindfully walk every day, that's a great practice. You can... Now, the difference is instead of walking and ruminating about work and worrying about all the mistakes you made in the past, you decide, I'm going to feel my feet against the sidewalk. I'm going to notice the trees. I'm going to just notice my thoughts and feelings as they come and go. That's, that's a mindfulness practice versus getting lost in an automatic pilot. So you can really do mindfulness in almost any activity if you just choose ahead of time to set the attention, intention to pay attention while you're actually doing it. Yeah, and, and, may, and I hear so often, you know, people don't have time for it, but I've actually turned it into um, my job. So the first 10, 15 minutes of my work day is mindfulness, is some yeah. sort of mindfulness or meditation. It's, it's my job. Yeah, yeah. And what's great is, yeah, I, I think it's, it's like exercise, right? Um, you set the time aside to develop uh, the skills, but the point is to bring that into your life. Now, I don't even know if this is true, but this kind of fits in with longevity. I once heard that if you exercise regularly most of your life, you'll probably live about 10 years longer or so. But if you add up all the hours you spend exercising over a lifetime, it's probably about 10 years. <laughs> now, now, if you exercise, now, if you exercise, that doesn't mean you stop exercising like, ah, oh, it's not worth it. You know, it's not the whole, whether or not those numbers are true. The point of exercise is that it makes you feel more alive and more energetic and more able to do things. So it's the same with mindfulness. It can be very helpful, especially in the beginning, to set a time, a regular, set aside a regular time to practice and consciously work on this. But the point is to bring it into your life, into your relationships. I mean, right now, this is mindfulness. We're present with each other. We're talking about uh, things that matter to us. It's not any different than if I was sitting somewhere and doing a formal practice. Now, the way we have people practice doing that is to choose one activity a day. This is kind of an initial assignment we give people. Choose one activity a day where you can consciously practice being present. So it might be brushing your teeth, right? Have you ever brushed your teeth so automatically you're thinking about work and then you walk out the door and you don't really remember if you brushed your teeth or not? So you're trying to taste your teeth and see if you actually, if that's the one you pick, you can say, okay, I'm going to practice paying attention. So you notice you turn the knob and it's got some pressure the water comes down and it sparkles a certain way and it goes down the drain. Maybe there's a certain smell or temperature thing happening. You put your brush in there and you feel the resistance and the bristles sparkle. There's a lot 
going on that we just tune out most of the time. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a mystical experience every time you brush your teeth, but it's a way of practicing because what'll happen is your mind goes off and keep bringing it back to what you're doing. And you'll get this experience of, this is a funny thing to say, but even the most dull, uh, unpleasant parts of your day become less unpleasant when you're just doing them. Because usually the stress of what you're doing comes from, oh, I wish I was doing something else, or the anticipation, oh no, this meeting is gonna be stressful. And so that ends up very often creating more stress than the actual moment to moment experience of what you're actually doing. So this trains us to be able to stay more present. And again, if something, if a crisis is going on, you don't necessarily go off to another state of consciousness. I mean, if you can, that's great, but this also allows us to practice staying with what's happening, make a better choice about what's happening, deal with the situation a little bit better. So, so often when I talk to doctors um, and, and health practitioners such as yourself, it seems like there's always something that they do for themselves that they're not comfortable talking to patients about, or, or sometimes there's a liability around talking to patients about. Can you share with me anything that you do that you really don't share with anybody else? Yeah, so <laughs> funny, you're asking people to move into their discomfort as we are talking about here before. Um, yeah, you know, one thing that I always do once a year, there is a, uh, a mountain retreat that I go to with my ninja teacher. So we're out in the mountains and camp out there most of the time. And there's an old Japanese practice called Shugendo. And it's basically connecting with nature. So we start hiking trails and go up and down and sit in front of uh, uh, fires and, and just kind of see if we can let go of some of the chatter and just get more in touch with what's going on around us. And the final piece of the weekend is there's this big cold waterfall that pours this stream of water down. So we all have to hike all the way down to this place where all of this water comes down and we stand under a waterfall and we symbolize, we have this symbolic visualization of this hitting us and sort of cleansing everything out and refreshing us and kind of gaining some energy from that. So, you know, it might sound a little weird to some of my scientific colleagues, but it's such an experiential piece. Instead of intellectually understanding the importance of moving into our experiences, you know, you have that experience because you think, oh, this water's so cold. Or you think, I can't take another step hiking back up this mountain. But in this moment, I just put my foot here and I put my foot here. So it's a way of building up our intention and you know, deciding what our goal is and moving through. Um, and it's just a wonderful, even though that sounds like an intense thing, everybody there is very kind and loving. And so there's an energy and the uh, camaraderie that uh, I get from seeing my friends there. And it's just, just kind of a magical place, a magical experience that I do. Wouldn't necessarily recommend that to everyone else though. <laughs> I love it. It sounds like perfect vacation to me. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, especially when your friends start swinging swords at you. Or, <laughs> that sounds even better. My kids do this the right way, but we all know what we're doing, so no one ever gets hurt. So, <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. So, how can people get in hold of you? How can they get in touch with you if they want to learn more or speak to you personally? Yeah, well, my website is www.psych insights.com, or if you just Google Richard Sears Ninja or Psychologist. Uh, I'm sure I'll pop up there in the search. And uh, yeah, I've got some free recordings there on the website, like including the three minute one that we did. I've got a few that are a little bit longer there. Uh, I've also got a way if people want to give me their email address, uh, you'll have access to some more videos and uh, some other things I'm planning to do and setting up right now is some online mindfulness groups, which sounds like a funny thing, but just as we're experiencing, we haven't actually met face to face, but I can feel you know, sort of a connection with us just talking here. For people that don't have a local group that they can go to to learn mindfulness, we can set it up through video interactions. I'll probably have some that are recordings for people that can do it self-paced, but just like this, uh, we can set things up through a video system and have 
people experience the exercises and uh, ask questions. And it's nice because uh, it's an eight week program. So systematically you can work through the challenges because initially you come in thinking, ah, oh, this is great. And then you start running into roadblocks and issues that come up. So it's nice to have other people to sort of bounce things off of and benefit from other people's experiences. Uh, and then I'll also be offering some in-person retreats for the people that just really love this stuff and want to get more in depth. And we'll, we'll set up some live things where we can just sort of let go of our daily responsibilities for a few days and just really immerse ourselves in this. There's there's sort of an, an effect that you get, as I'm sure you've experienced, when it's it's nice to touch base with it, but to have enough time to really get deeply into shedding all those automatic thoughts and worries, it can, it can really be a powerful experience. And the other thing I'll mention, by the way, is for people that are wanting to get started with this, in my experience, it's much better to even do that three-minute exercise or something similar just a little bit every day, something consistent is much better than a whole weekend once a year or, you know, uh, once in a while somebody gets really excited and they say, I'm going to start waking up at 4 a.m. and meditate for two hours every morning. And I will literally say, please don't do that because <laughs> you'll do it once. <laughs> and then you'll say, this is no fun. I'm exhausted and nothing's happening. And then you'll just sleep in for a minute. It's much better to start very small and consistent so you can build on that and if it seems natural you'll you'll add more time if you find that valuable and I think that's a nice thing too um, it tends to be self-rewarding the more you do this the more you in, enjoy doing that and the more motivating it is for you to continue but until you hit that point it can be nice to have a structured program of some kind and a community because I know that in some communities, it's really hard to find people that are practicing mindfulness. And I know it still has a little bit of a stigma around it. So um, yeah. I think having a community of people you can talk to safely and, and yeah. feel confident in talking to them is really important. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because the word mindfulness is out there all over the place. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. People are getting more attention, but... A lot of people are kind of using that, but they don't really know the depth of what they're doing or what they're doing is not really mindfulness. And so if somebody goes to a place in their community, I just highly recommend people check, check them out, you know, interview them, talk to them. You have to really watch out for something called the guru syndrome, where I feel like I'm better than people. You know, you really want more like a, a friend to work through this, more of a mentor. Um, if they're somehow hiding things or you know think they're better than you that's that's a dangerous red flag uh in my experience you know the more you do this especially the more you you can just kind of see that in people it's like you say oh yeah i mean when you meet them they feel real uh to you as opposed to people that try to force it and <laughs> i hope i don't offend anybody with this but i've been around some so-called meditation slash mindfulness teachers they talk like this as if they have no emotions and they're always in a state of equanimity, you know, and, and I'll see them yelling at the cashier later on. I mean, that's not being human, you know, all humans have emotions. So to me, it's more important to be real and, uh, you know, not get stuck in your emotions, of course. But, uh, and, you know, you might think that's the goal. If you've had a really chaotic life or you feel like you've been knocked around by your emotions, wouldn't it be great to feel nothing? Well, no, our emotions are what give us richness and vitality. So anyway, just some suggestions if you're looking for people, you know, choose wisely of uh, the mentors you decide to work with. I love that. Well, hopefully everyone will go work with you and your group. So Richard, I, I just want to thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure talking to you today. And I know I've learned a ton and I, I of course, feel better. <laughs> just sort of relaxed to go in to go play with my kids now. So, but thank you for being here and spending your time with us today. It's been wonderful. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. All right. Thank you.